ओके गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वंस अगेन आई वेलकम यू टू द वर्चुअल क्लास एंड द रिसोर्स पर्सन इज मिसेस तिट्टी देओ एस्टन प्रोफेसर फैकल्टी ऑफ हिस्ट्री इन दिल्ली यूनिवर्सिटी एज आई टोल्ड यू मिसेस देओ इज अ सीरियस रिसर्च स्कॉलर कनेक्टेड विद प्रोजेक्ट्स ऑफ यूजीसी एज वेल एज Oregon University, United States, CEDAR Education, MA, MPhil, PhD from JNU, and she is a serious research scholar as well as very active in virtual classes of different universities. And Mrs. Deo will be speaking on the social questions on the colonialism. This is a very interesting topic because we will be seeing what are the social relations and the British imperial policy towards the tribals, how they discriminated on a social plane among different classes of people, what was their motive, how the women responded, and how the people of India responded, whether there was a protest or not, and how far the protest. was powerful in shaking the foundation of the british empire as you know when the east india company came they were a beer trading company but gradually and particularly after 1764 battle of buxar they could get hold of the revenue collection of the east india and from that time onwards a trading company became the territorial master of the a big chunk of india and as the primary motive of colonial rule was to have british interest only and subordinate the indian interest and it was reflected in all the spheres of their policy take the example of draining of wealth how the east india company drained wealth from india by transfer of funds they got money from territorial revenue that is the revenue from land revenue collection and invested that money in commercial <coughs> enterprises so they didn't have to spend anything from their own pocket and they were amassing huge amount of wealth and sending some to britain as home charges paying the officers of east india company and here also paying the soldiers and the officers of the east india company not only that they invested in china also so this this i mean predates the present day mnc and they were in a bit better position because they didn't have to spend anything then in the social plan the british had an arrogant attitude which was reflected in all sphere supply and they followed to the letter and spirit of rudyard kipling kipling who wrote the white man's burden in 1899 before that and after that this was the synchronon of the british policy a racial arrogance rudyard kipling said that it was the white man's burden to civilize the natives a civilizing mission and he called upon the able bodied englishmen to go to the colonies and educate within courts half child half devil this was the term given to the indigenous people whether in the philippines or india and with this attitude from the beginning of 1764 up to 1947 this strand of racial supremacy pervaded in the british policy british colonial policy and it was reflected as you will see today in the tribal policy in the social discrimination in almost all their policies so with this i request mrs tripti deo to give her lecture thank you 
thank you very much professor mishra for uh, giving a very comprehensive introduction to the topic that we'll be taking up today so good morning everyone good morning um, uh, you know our students who have joined us today and uh, so today i'll be taking up um, i'll let me just take you through my slide first and we'll begin with our uh, presentation with my presentation i hope all of you can see this slide that i have uh, So, uh, British colonial period is a is a familiar territory. Everybody knows what it is going to be like, and uh, basically we'll be studying that particular period only with several themes around. So, uh, is my slide visible? Can I just check with a technical person, Mr. Anand? My slide. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. ma'am. Visible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, uh, the topic, the 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 theme that we'll be discussing today is evolution of social structures in India through the ages. Some social questions under colonialism. So, our discussion today will not be plain on a political, uh, you know, trajectory of this period, but we will be looking at some of the social, samajik sthar pe kya ho raha tha is particular opnivesik kal jo tha colonial period jo tha, jisme Britishers ne India ko rule kiya tha, uski samajik taay kya thi? So, what were the social questions? So uh we welcome our fourth semester students uh, to this particular lecture now the broad themes of this um, uh, theme of, of this uh, uh, the block that we'll be studying uh, the unit 1 will have and i'm directly uh, considering and uh, directing you to the e resource that you'll be referring to eventually which is uploaded on your uh, website on the orissa state open university website so that it's easier for you to kind of handle my lecture and also study parallelly from there um so the unit 1 that you will see in that e resource booklet is colonial forest policies and tribal criminal tribes uh, i'll be spending about 20 minutes on this uh, and i'll be studying this unit particularly in detail unit 2 which is on gender aspects women under colonialism at unit 3 social discrimination unit 4 uh, popular protests and social structures and unit 5 studying tribes under colonialism so the unit 2 3 4 and 5 i'll take up briefly not as much in detail as i will be taking up unit 1 so um, uh what you should broadly keep in your mind while you looking at the entire um uh you know uh, the the topic is that britishers were here to colonize britishers were in, in, in colonized india primarily for their own commercial benefit yes and uh, they made many they used many methods like they used methods of pacification they used methods of conquest so they used different methods to um kind of uh, take control of situations to make it easier for them to uh, uh, you know fulfill their commercial needs so keeping that in mind the colonial the basic um, idea of colonialism is to actually gain profit for your own economy and that's what britishers were doing so all of that that we'll be studying in this particular uh, um unit is kind of related to that baseline of british colonial policy of uh, discriminating uh, different things in india to fulfill their own commercial um uh, fulfillments okay so keeping that in mind let's go to our first unit and the uh, the colonial forest policy and criminal tribes and in that particular unit you will find uh, uh the first topic as pre colonial legacy so before we move to what the britishers were doing in their colonial period what was happening before the pre colonial period so let's keep our uh, ears open in terms of understanding that we are discussing the pre colonial period colonial period uh, is uh, uh, connoted to the britishers coming in the colonial period and but we are going to look at the pre colonial period what was happening before the britishers came in because that is also sometimes uh, glorified as period uh, which where where in india was doing better india was doing good uh, i won't say glorified but yes really it was doing good because britishers when they came in they were at um, uh, getting commercial profits so there were uh, there was aggressive form of exploitation that began with the britishers so let's look at the first uh, point that i've mentioned in the pre colonial legacy so alfred crossby calls um, 
right, as an ecological imperialism, the colonial period. And basing on this, I'll explain this ecological imperialism a, a little later. Uh, he talks about, uh, um, you know, ecological imperialism and Gadgil and Guha, Madhav Gadgil and Ramachandra Guha, who have done phenomenal work on environmental history and trying to see, uh, relate that to the British um, colonial policy. Uh, they said that the colonialism was a period of ecological watershed. And uh, the three basic features of this ecological uh, of this colonial intervention that impacted eco um, ecological, uh, the, you know, eco ecology in India, he says that the three basic elements, Gatkin and Guha in their book, which is Fissure Land, it's a very, very good book. So if some of our students are interested, they can take a look at it. Written very, very easily. It's a very uh, easy read. And uh, you'll really uh, want to finish the book at one go. So try and read that particular book. So the three basic features of this ecological intervention that was different from what was happening previously was that there was a shift from subsistence oriented resource gathering and food production to commercial production. So now peasants were not producing to consume only for their own subsistence, but they were they were being they were being told to produce for commercial use. That means that um, there would be markets where they'll have to sell their or sell off their goods. They'll be they'll they and they have to produce a certain variety of uh, crops so, which are more required in the market. So there was commerce that was happening in this um, in on in agriculture. So commercialization basically um, because of that uh, from the subsistence economy, subsistence oriented resource, um, the village economy moved to a commercial production. The second basic feature that he talks about is the destruction of cohesive local communities. So, of course, when this kind of a um, relationship of producing for commercial purposes is is uh, is initiated, there will be destruction of the local communities. That means the relationship that the local communities have with each other will also be impacted. So, destruction in terms of people became more individualistic. All right, emergence of individualism in their place. So rather than a community, a cohesive local communi communi community feeling, it became more emergence of more individualism and in, 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 individualistic, uh, you know, individualistic phenomenon. The third important uh, basic feature that um, Gadgil Guha talks about is the breakdown of a system of restraints on traditional resource use due to development of markets. The way markets spurred and the way markets spread uh, during the colonial period was phenomenal. And that also changed the way um, peasants or, uh, you know, tribes were being impacted and the, their engagement with the markets and broader uh, economy. So these are three features that make the colonial period different from the pre-colonial period. So pre-colonial period was also where the economy was uh, flourishing and there were there, there was a uh, you know a certain kind of um, uh, ecological uh, uh, ecological i wouldn't say discrimination or uh, destruction but there was use of ecology for the purpose but the way it changed in the colonial period was phenomenal so i'm trying to emphasize this again and again because that's the basic point of this entire unit Richard Grove, on the other hand, you know, he he says that he did not believe that pre-colonial period was a golden age of ecological balance and harmony. So uh, uh, we tend to kind of bifurcate the pre-colonial and colonial period in the way that we look at the pre-colonial period as a is, is a golden age, you know, where nothing um, uh, um, uh, of an exploitative nature happened. And we look at the colonial period as everything exploitative happening at this point of time. But Richard Grove says, yes, you know, there was it uh, it wasn't a golden age. The Mughals, the Marathas who were there in the pre-colonial period, it wasn't that they were not exploiting the forest resource. And he gives he gives example that not only in the Mughal period, but before for that also, rulers in every dynasty and empires in India used forest produced, you know, controlled tribes used forest revenue and resource, you know, for their own purpose. So there wasn't that there was balance and harmony in the pre-colonial period, and there was sudden um, exploitation in the colonial period. So Richard Grove is trying to give that perspective, which is also quite true because it was pretty gradual. But yes, what the, the three features that differentiate the colonial period from the pre-colonial period that Guha and Gadgil talk about is, is uh, important to remember because that's, 
the, that's the difference that um, made uh, uh, you know the, the colonial economy more um, um, uh, exploitative in nature for the Indian uh, colonial uh, uh, Indian, in Indian colonial setup, uh, Indian colonial forest setup. So although commercial compulsions were there, but in the process of forest clearance in pre-colonial period, there were no sharp conflicts over con uh, control of forest resource. Abundant arable land was available in the pre-colonial period. Limited state control was there. It wasn't that the state was tight in controlling the um, the forest uh, tribes or you know the people who were de de who were dependent on the forest tribes hierarchy of users rights were maintained of the people who tilled the land so it wasn't as aggressive the pre-colonial period was not as aggressive or as exploitative as we see the britishers doing in the colonial period Another very important aspect of the colonial forest policy are the forest acts and ecological warfare. Now, look at the terms, you know, ecological imperialism, ecological warfare. Now, why have historians and environmentalists used this partic these particular terms? Because indeed, you know, it was very, very aggressive and exploitative in its nature. Yeah, ecological warfare, because there was literally a war on how much the state should have, how maximum the state should have. So let's look at the first bullet point. More demands for forest goods now. Emergence of contractors and managing house. So because with the Britishers coming in India, and like Professor Mishra mentioned, that they were trying to manage everything with the kind of with profits available from India. So the British entire British administration was being sponsored by Indian people only. It wasn't that the money or the salaries of these uh, administrator, British, uh, British administrators are coming from Britain. No, they were being paid. They were being the entire establishment was being paid and sponsored from the Indian revenue. So you can now see that the demands for revenue would increase. Demands for forest goods, which are important source of revenue, would increase. So, so much so that the Britishers had uh, contractors managing houses like in one in Hyderabad, you know, uh, which will who um, maintain uh, uh, forest produce coming, uh, which will maintain sure that forest produce was coming to the state. Another important aspect of the Forest Act and ecological warfare is that the commercial demand for timber increase. Now, this is a very important point. Why did the commercial demand, matlab, lakdi ke liye, timber, lakdi ke liye demand jo hai, wo bahut bad gai. Aap ke ke Royal Navy jo hai, Britishers ki, that was at its peak at this point of time, you know, because of the trade. You know that the maximum trade and exchange of goods happen through the sea. It doesn't happen on the land. It happens through the sea. It happens overseas. So the shipbuilding activities really took up a huge leap. Iron smelting, etc. So for all of this, what was needed was timber. Lakdi ki zurrati. So demand jaise bad gayi, waise pressure bhi forest pe bad gaya. As simple as that. You don't have to use your mind too much. But it is about as the demand of the timber in, in, increased, there would be pressure on the forest. There would be pressure on the people who are dependent on that forest. Yes, and the most durable timber was Indian teak. Indian teak. Teak is a variety of lakri, which was demand in demand because it was sturdy, durable. Thi. Demand for British Royal Navy, I've already mentioned this point to you. Expansion of cultivable land due to clearing of forest in northern India after the 1860s affected nomadic pastoral economy of plains. Now, it was just not about the um the 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 wood or the timber that was important in the forest but even expansion of cultivable land that means the production from the land grains and other production um uh, from the land was also important and that was also parallelly being done so a lot of clearing of forest was also done in north india so colonial forest policy you should not just understand that it was the lakri that the timber that was important what was also important was how this forest was being cleared for agricultural cultivation, for agricultural cultivation. And that also affected the nomadic and pastoral economy of the plains. Okay. And the, the nomadic and pastoral, because um, uh, the nomadic and pastoral economy is based on forests. If forests are cleared, then they will have to leave the forest and move to plains for doing some other activity because um, uh, it has affected their basic mode of production.
expansion of railways apart from shipbuilding expansion of railways after 1850s and we can see that from around 1349 kilometers in 1860s to 51658 kilometers in 1910 so that's the railway line that was um, the increase in railway line the, the the kilometers that it increased so all of this was based on the resource that um, was drawn from the forest so the pace of deforestation मतलब फॉरेस्ट को क्लियर करना लकड़ी पेड़ काटना डिफॉरेस्ट्रेशन वो बढ़ता गया इस पीरियड में और बढ़ता ही जा रहा था टीक साल एंड दियोदर ये तीन वेराइटी जो है टीक साल एंड दियोदर दीज थ्री वेराइटीज ऑफ टिम्बर वॉज मोस्ट सुटेबल फॉर स्लीपर तो आप देखेंगे कि ट्रेन में अगर आप स्लीपर क्लास या स्लीपर बेड्स जो होते हैं उसके लिए जो एक बहुत ड्यूरेबल लकड़ी की जरूरत है और वो टीक साल और दियोदर वेराइटी है उसको उसकी जो है डिमांड बढ़ गई डिमांड फॉर टीक साल दियोदर इंक्रीज एंड बिकॉज द स्लीपर बेड्स इन द इन द ट्रेन वर मच मोर इन डिमांड दैन द नॉर्मल यू नो सीटिंग अरेंजमेंट सो यू सी दैट द फॉरेस्ट गुड्स एंड द डिमांड्स Com just transformed and just uh, increased in a phenomenal way, and that affected you know many things. Let's move forward to uh, what were these forest acts? The Imperial Forest Department Forest Acts. So, for a uh, British colonial fulfilment, again I'm going back to what how the Britishers wanted to fulfill their colonial needs. Now, colonial needs is the economic needs that the the uh, uh, the, the commercial needs that needs to be fulfilled, and there was the need for legislation. legitimate state and intervention and this eventually resulted in denudation and droughts after 1837 so because of this extremely aggressive nature of forest clearance you know uh, changing the way um, the the peasants the nomads the pastoralists are already were functioning changing the way in the sense that because the way they were functioning that was being impacted you know that their basic uh, way of living uh what they were dependent on for subsistence that changed and that led to a lot of difficult situation like the denudation and droughts the droughts matlab akal pad raha tha uh, there were a lot of famines and denudations that happened after 1837 because if you can exploit a land to a certain extent after that the land also gives up you know it will start either it will go barren it will not do anything it will become unproductive and if that becomes unproductive directly people who are dependent on that land will be affected all of us can relate to this yes so um, the situations of droughts and famines in india really increased by 1837 Yes. Shifting cultivation. अब इस शिफ्टिंग कल्टिवेशन को झूम भी बोलते हैं बहुत सारे नाम से ये जाना जाता है डिफरेंट स्टेट में वेर कल्टिवेशन डेन एट वन प्लेस यू नो यू कीप शिफ्टिंग टू डिफरेंट लैंड राइट सो शिफ्टिंग कल्टिवेशन वॉज हेल्प रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर डिफॉरेस्ट्रेशन सो यू टू ऑल्सो अंडरस्टैंड दैट द ब्रिटिशर्स वर ट्राइंग टू यूज एनी रैशनल और जस्टिफाई एनी थिंग ऑफ डूइंग और नॉट डूइंग by saying that this was this is not a good practice this is a bad practice so they consider shifting cultivation as a very bad practice now for indians and for tribes and for pe indian peasants shifting cultivation has been a traditional practice that has worked for them but the britishers when they came because it did not suit them why did it not suit them because people will keep moving from one place to another if they do shifting cultivation and they wanted people to settle down at one place and do agricultural activity in that settled land yes so shifting cultivation was held responsible for deforestation it was in fact banned in several places like kurg right it was restricted in belgaon and then several examples that you can find in your e resource so they were trying to place a justification that this is not good for you you should not do it but indians have been doing that for a long time so because it did not suit the way britishers wanted india to function they considered that as an irresponsible as a bad behavior or a bad practice right so they for example treated shifting cultivation as responsible for deforestation because uh, people were moving and they were cutting uh, they were they were you know clearly clearing lands for their cultivation for their cultivation purpose from one place to another uh, moving from one place to another so you will see that how britishers policies gradually were also suiting the britishers needs 
peasants. And of course, it was at the cost of the way Indian peasants, nomads, castes looked at and were functioning for a long day's time. So let's look at the Forest Act of 1865. Now, uh, that's my third bullet point in this particular slide. Imperial Forest Department created the first um, um, bureaucratic, formal bureaucratic all India structure by uh, initiating this legal, pro uh, legal act or Forest Act of 1865. Now, this was the first act. Forest Act. And um, D. Brandis was the first inspector general of the of, of the forest. And there are many features of this Forest Act that you know you can, you know, might as well, you might as well take a look at it um, um, you know, uh, from 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 your e resource. But let me just uh, tell you that uh, briefly that what uh, this particular uh, uh, act really was. Now according to this 186 prior to 1865 basically it recognized the customary rights of the of the peasants so you understand that there are certain customary rights that means a, a, a village has certain area where um, uh, customary rights of of common land you know if there's a common land where people can just uh, go and take water from or or the forest resource from so that was already there in the pre colonial policy that was never taken from the people but a uh, common property resource became a problem you know uh, the, the it became a problem in the way that that was being contested property now britishers did not want people to have a free will in the common property or the common land they also wanted to restrict that so pre colonial policy the rulers and um, um, pre in the pre colonial period the rulers and the empires never worried or never interfered in the common property area of the community land but britishers tried to restrict that also and that really had a huge devastating effect on the people or, or in that village or that forest around that forest now the three strands of uh, you know thinking uh, three strands of thinking when we discuss the common property resource and this is a very important aspect the three distinct strands uh, one talks about is uh, the first strand being annexationist now the annexationist annexation annexationist so primarily gadgil and goha in their study have said that annex annexationist uh, were those colonial administrators who thought that they wished that the total state control over forest so I'm talking about my fourth uh, point in this, the common property resource. So the way the common property resource was being um, uh, understood and perceived, there was a little debate among the colonial administrators. That means colonial officials who were involved in forest functioning of uh, uh, under the Britishers, Indian forest functioning. Now they, the first, one of the strand was of the people who believed that the entire forest should be under the British rule. That's the first strand. They're called the annexationists. Okay, annexation is to annex, to control, to take over. So those people who believed in taking control of the entire forest, all of the forest, the entire forest should be under the British rule, is the first strand of thinking. The second prominent position was held by those, and especially in the, the officials of the Madras state, the Madras government, colonial government, they believed they denied the legitimacy of any state intervention, the customary rights of use exercised by rural communities. So they said, um, they, they uh, propagated this view that the state should be denied any uh, control over any intervention over the customary rights of the people. So they did not believe in taking control of the entire forest. This group of colonial officials, especially in, the, in Madras, believed that the, the common property or the, uh, the customary rights of the peasants and the tribals should be retained to them and state has no right to intervene in that. The third strand, you know, uh, uh, belief, they held the view that the state had undisputable right in certain cases yes but they also favored retention of customary rights of villagers to freely graze their cattle and goats so again very close to the second position they said that yes the state has undisputable rights over the forest but then they should also retain customary rights like grazing rights of the people of uh, grazing rights of the cattle by the uh, you know and uh, uh, to cut wood this should be retained and this should this should be retained by the people of that particular region of that particular forest so um with the passing of uh, the 1865 act you know really changed the way people were thinking about forest the colonial of there was a literal debate on the way forest produce should be used 
Another Forest Act that continued after 1865 was 1878. This further strengthened um, uh, the control and there were new three new categories uh, of um, forests that was uh, designated at this point of time the reserve forest the protected forest and the village forest now what were these reserve protected and village forest again the description is given in your e resource but basically the reserve forest consisted of compact and valuable areas which would lend themselves to sustain exploitation that means a limited area which the government will reserve Okay, the government will, the colonial government will reserve because that, the produce from that particular area of, of from that particular forest is commercially very important for the Britishers. So that will be reserved by the um, British colonial British administration, forest administration. The second is the protected forest. This means that under state, they will be under state control where rights of state and other users were recorded. Okay, so uh, you people who are using that forest and people who are uh, and the government they both have control over that particular uh, forest but they they are recorded that means for example um, if there is a reservation of a particular tree species the, the state can reserve that okay um, uh, teak uh, or uh, sal trees will not be used by the common people there so there were there was control by both the the the, the forest department and the people, but the forest department can at times also control and reserve certain species of forest produce in that region, in that forest. The third um, is the village forest. Now, village forest in this was hardly exercised, um, and large part of um, and and the scope of uh, therefore you know the forest um, act of eighteen seventy eight it enlarged the punitive actions and penalties. So uh, if one would not uh, abide by the way the, the rules and laws were made uh, as per the forest officials and acts, punitive actions, strict actions and penalties will have to be paid by the people, local people there. So uh, these acts actually selectively assist plantation of timber, timber trees, even manipulated renewal cycles. So the worst they did was that a land which may be suitable for timber, a certain timber, uh, a certain other production, not timber, was forcefully being told, or the, the producers of that land were forcefully being told that no, not this produce, but timber should be put up, or this particular variety of tree should be raised and produced in that land. So they tried to selectively plant or selectively produce a certain crop or a variety of tree. Now, if that happens, you know, the the basic um, uh, uh, natural phenomena you're trying to change, you're selectively uh, using renewal cycles, you're selectively uh, trying to trying to uh, do th uh, change the way you would you you would want to uh, produce a certain variety so that was a major major you know problem that happened at this point of time by the 20th century it was not only timber but there were other varieties of forest produce like raisin turpentine for essential oils um, tanning material all of this the demand for these also increased at this point of uh, you know by the 20th century and this really led to uh, aggressive um, uh, exploitation of other forest produce than just um, just uh, timber and the variety of timber moving forward in the I'm, I'm still at the first unit because i'm going to take more time on doing this unit in detail the another important um, theme in the in the colonial forest policy is the impact of the colonial forest policy in the indigenous community so indigenous community are people living in that forest around that forest now the impact was not uniform and there, there were, of course, ruinous, that means very bad consequences, results for nomadic and pastoralist, for people surviving on hunting, gathering and forest produce, and people who were based on, who based uh, themselves on shifting cultivation. So these were primarily groups of people who were being deeply impacted, badly impacted by the colonial forest policy. And I'm sure now you're a bit clear on why they are though they were being impacted. I've already explained a couple of points related to this in my previous slides. It also affected the ecology of a certain plant. So I told you that if a certain plant was in a commercial demand for a commercial were, were demand were the de were demanded more by the British administration, they were being produced more, they were being forced to produce more. 
so what how what impacted this um, uh, how it impacted was it impacted the ecology of that particular region so certain plants like oak terminalia they were replaced with teak pine and deodar so you see because teak pine and deodar was in more demand oak and terminalia they suffered they were not being planted land that was more suitable for oak and terminalia there also oak and terminalia was not being produced rather teak and pine, teak pine and deodar were being cropped or or um, they were being uh, planted so you really changing the way the natural ecology of that region that's what britishers did and that was devastating shifting cultivators forced to stop their methods like baigas mandala mandala balaghat bilaspur now these were regions where baiga tribe was there they were completely based on shifting cultivation methods they were they were told to stop this method in fact we will see that how they were labeled as criminal tribes because they did not um uh, were not ready to have sedentary agriculture as their basic subsistence so we will see that in our next slides tribals were forced to adopt sedentary agriculture now you can odisha is a state of tribes now you um, it has many many tribes now can you uh, and we can all understand that can we really force a tribal group or a tribe to do a certain thing no we cannot they have for for the longest time in history and their origin you know they've been following a certain and they they shouldn't be told what to do what not to do that's the way they've been living they, you cannot force one cannot force uh, the tribals to come and live in cities come and you know uh, do a sedentary agriculture because that doesn't really suit the way they have been functioning for a long time and with due respect um, you know people um, of of forest that's the place that uh, uh, they have been uh, nurturing for the longest time and so tribals at, I'm, i'm talking about the 19th and the 20th century if you go back there the tribals were at that point of time were forced to adopt sedentary agriculture which many of them could not many of them did eventually and uh, that also led them to uh, the uh, join uh, factories in 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 in, uh, in um, cities at very low prices so we'll come to all of that a little later it also led to devastation of traditional conservation methods indigenous wisdom was being ignored um uh, institutionalized hunting uh, as an organized sport for physical fitness and white sahibs so even hunting as an activity was restricted it was it was kind of um um organized as a entertainment activity for the white uh, sahibs in the sense that they were uh, organized for the british colonial officials there was also resistance it wasn't that uh, we were passively facing all of this um from the british there was resistance there was migration defiance of forest laws legal assertion of their rights there were also open rebellions by people in the forest and around they were called fituris now another important uh, aspect of uh, the the colonial forest policy is pacifying the internal frontiers now what do you mean by pacifying that means you appease you try and negotiate what is happening and you try and organize a particular frontier internal frontiers is within the 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 forest uh, how were they trying to um, um maintain certain uh, um elements in a certain way so to stop unruly now i'm putting this in quotes because this is a language that britishers used in their texts in their writings to stop unruly elements such as pindaris and other nomadic groups they controlled and distributed forest and cultivable waste land now pindaris and like i told you all the, there are many many other nomadic groups nomadic groups are groups who who move from one place to another now nomadic groups they were treated as and they were considered as unruly elements and to control them a certain area of forest was given a certain you know controlled uh, um, uh, the cultivable wasteland was given so that to them so that they remain in that region they were not allowed to move too much because th that was not something that suited the british way of administration they the britishers could not control a moving tribe they cannot so that therefore they wanted that tribe to settle down at a place and that was something that was disturbing the way traditionally a certain group has been staying for a long time 
they also attempted to settle and discipline nomadic groups like i've already mentioned uh, that they were trying to discipline the nomadic groups like gujars bhatis rangars rajput meos the different tribes that who were moving um, uh, from one place to another for their subsistence but the britishers tried to discipline them they also used surveillance and social control to bind social groups into civility and um, uh, we will, we have an example of uh, wh sleeman he was a british colonial official who actually was the head of the thuggy and the dacoity department so some of you must have seen this movie the thugs of hindustan you know, that was you know, amir khan uh, took the lead in that uh, um, it came around 3 to 4 years back now uh, that very uh, clearly depicted the way um, the thuggies they were uh, branded uh, as uh, robbers and they were branded as criminals by the british and uh, wh sleeman had held this head headed this department of thuggy and dacoity department to investigate and punish gang robberies and murders used legal language against a variety of marginal groups who did not conform conform means did not abide to settle and provide wage labor now what did britishers need from them they needed them to settle and be their laborers they wanted them to settle either be agriculturalist or give them other kind of labor laboring activities like wage laborers so that's what they expected from these nomadic forest dwellers and pastoralists some of them conformed they abided some of them did not those who did not were tagged as unruly elements legal actions were taken against them they were prisoned they were branded we'll see all of that in the coming slides now the the another very important aspect of forest tribes is the criminal law tribes act now i've already spoken a little about how these tribes were uh, were branded um and there were legal actions and legalities were made around them so let's look at the criminal tribes act 1871 registration according to this act registration of all or any such tribe that was notified as criminal tribes now again criminal tribes is a word britishers use that's why i put this in the quotation put uh, in uh, the, the in the quotation marks they had to register they had registered members to report themselves to local police authority at regular intervals notify the place of residence or any change any contravention led to punitive action so a certain tribe that was treated as criminal tribe by the britishers they had to report to the local police every now and then report if there's any change in residence report every activity that was they was doing they were doing and if these so called criminal tribes were not abiding by these rules punitive actions strict actions were being taken this was according to the tribals act 1871 according to this act almost 150 tribes were treated as criminal now the word criminal has a huge impact please try and see uh, think about that you are treated as a as doing a crime you treated as a criminal so when you one is treated as a criminal then there are legal actions that are taken on them and this branding was done according to the way britishers wanted because it did not work for for them a certain tribe did not conform to them they were treated as criminals so it's it was pretty harsh it was really harsh and aggressive policy of exploitation towards these tribes so they act the act listed about 150 tribes as criminal they belong to marginalized social groups reference to their caste identity as criminal so not only that particular person of the tribe was treated as criminal but the entire tribe or caste was treated as criminal now that's a huge thing crime as an inborn trait of selected communities like bavaris in the lower doa region kanjra and sansis they were treated as dangerous animals to be watched tamed hunted upon now if you pay attention to every word that i have used in this particular point there are strict punitive actions strict punitive ways in the in the in the way that in these people were categorized and identified with for for no mistake of theirs but because they wanted to follow their traditional ways of subsistence methods special laws rules and procedures dealing with the criminal classes again criminal classes is a word um, terminology that britishers are using sorry uh, dealing with criminal classes denied rights to appeal in any ordinary court so these people who, who were branded and treated as criminals were could not even appeal in any ordinary court so you can understand their plight 
amended criminal tribe act in 1908 so after 1871 uh, the next tribal act was an amended act in 1908 it convicted to be settled in special settlements sanctified prisons treated as captive labor at miserable um, conditions in factories state forest and public department works department so people could be those not confirming those tribes not confirming were actually prisoned now and they had sanctified prison they had a certain place where uh, their prisons were and they were they were made captive they were uh, they were prisoned and they were also um, used as wage laborers and of course the condition of the factories and the wage laborers the laborers um, uh, in the public department factory state forest was miserable so uh, all of that you can read further from this particular section now this is my i think last uh, slide of uh, yes uh, of this particular section on um, colonial forest policy law versus custom now i've already mentioned in a way that what why was there a conflict because there was a conflict because there was a certain custom in the way or tradition in the way a particular category of people try forest dwellers were practicing or their lives were living their lives and there was there were laws and punitive actions and legalities that the britishers brought in so there was there was conflict in these two spheres and so there was also a debate among the intellectuals and um, the colonial officials at that point of time because they used law some of them believe that law is most important law as most important source constituting its legitimacy appropriation of revenue forest and natural resources as legal rights of the state now please understand that britishers were outsiders they have come taken conquered india but how will they rule india they have never they don't belong to our history but how will they rule india they will have to make certain mechanisms certain rules which are accepted by everybody now a law if you make a legal act if you make an act or if you make a law that is generally accepted not generally but it is supposed to be accepted accepted by everybody now when the britishers make this law the law to appropriate revenue the law to appropriate forest goods the law to appropriate natural resources they have legal right over them then so therefore to get legitimacy to rule to get revenue it was important for them to make law the britishers to make law so the state projected and the britishers are making law by saying that we are doing this for your good you have not been using your forest resource properly you have not been tilling your land properly so we make a law and you follow this you will be able to produce better this is the justification that britishers british colonial officials officials are giving while they are drafting this law while they are making this law state also projected itself as a firm impartial law providing authority that respected uniform universal principles of jurisprudence so they use this big sounding words you know that uh, oh we are doing this because universal principles of jurisprudence um uh, uh, according to universal principles of juris students of a, a law can really help um, people in that particular region so they used rhetoric of reconciliation with laws customs of people rhetoric means they use these high sounding language to uh, convince people that this law is good for you this custom it was good for you this custom is bad for you so they are selectively retaining these customs and practices for example powerful land owning elites who were knit into the so powerful landing elites maybe the zamindars or the talukdars they were also part of the indigenous system of power but they were not they were not they were also they, they were not affected in the way that uh, and in fact they were patronized by the britishers because they knew that without them the the british colonial officials can't function so those people were not um, in in um, major targets on in the, under the special laws the laws that i've talked about they are uh, they are in not so much in the purview of that law they are not directly affected by the law 
they're not made targets in that law rather the marginalized rather communities are so broadly you know there's a lot that you can understand from the forest policies of this particular uh, you know pe uh, period and uh, please read more from the e resource let me quickly go to the next unit which is the gender women under colonialism now the word gender is familiar to everybody uh the it's the relationship between the man and the woman the male and the female the gender relations the woman under colonialism so let me read out the first point of my slide so the problems of women are often complex and they got they often got lost in the maze of culture ideology hegemony assertion of male politics national liberation movement that gained center stage so we will always see even today the issues of women gets fizzled out fizzles fizzles out that means the main problem is discussed main for them is any male problem or any general majority um, any uh, problem that uh, the men of the society feels um, that they are important but the problem that the women directly is facing uh, that gets lost even as as small as uh, getting reservation in 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 the political setup that has still not been passed you know by by in today's world um, by the the governments of the several um, several parts of the world i won't even talk about india per se so women problem has been has got lost here and there and the maze of culture ideology hegemony assertion of male politics it could never gain a center stage yes to an extent if you look at indian national movement it did gain certain center stage and i'll look at it in a, in briefly uh, in in a couple of minutes from now the image of a woman was always like a mother as a mother she was large as an image of a mother was largely dominant issues of middle class women found focus in the anti colonial movement when women middle class women started in the gandhian national movement started going outside their house to uh, to sit on satyagrahis as satyagrahis that's the time that in that process of anti colonial movement they came forward and their issues were being talked about when they started going to factories their issues were started being talked about the demand for women's education representations in various bodies and property rights these were other issues that were constantly being discussed from the 1920th century the 19th century women questions assumed center stage and this was also because of major reforms that happened because of reform activities uh, like anti sati bill in 1829 widow remarriage act in 1856 educational institutions for girls age of consent bill uh debated and contested at several levels so this was these were some of the features of the 19th century issues on women pandita ramabai ramabai rana de and tarabai shinde these were some women luminaries at in, in uh, during this period who took up the cause for women they were from west well established families but they they worked for um, raising issues from both the upper class and uh, especially the upper class women problems and Parth Chatterjee is a very famous historian he says that reforms was both emancipation and self emancipation for women highlighted about the image of the new woman fixed between confluence of modern bourgeois values of order and faithful order of traditional mooring so parth chatterjee is talking about that reforms were there and they helped in both emancipation and also the self emancipation of women the general emancipation that society wants to do of women and the women themselves um as actors of that uh, of emancipating themselves but they were always a problem because there was a, they were fixed between the modern ideas the modern bourgeois values and the traditional mooring the traditional idea that they have been cultured into and they have been expected to follow tanika sarkar another very famous historian modern historian who's worked on bengal she says that good woman in bengal was a good wife women's chastity a vocabulary of hindu nationalism so women's chastity his her purity her virginity was more important in the hindu nationalist debate space traditionally available to women in to read scriptures that help the finding way out for aspiration as expectations of women in traditional society so very interesting study of tanika sarkar where she says that the feminine autonomy for a woman in bengal was when she had she could read her own uh, she could read at her own will she's reading scriptures and that's help uh, and reading other literature she's reading it herself and that is helping her finding ways of aspiration and expectation so that was her way of freedom and autonomy it wasn't about really moving out but it was about finding that space within the household 
where she could think of an aspiration and expectation of uh, in the traditional society. In Southern India, leadership of Veera Sasligam um, uh, was very important. Anti-Notch movement uh, became uh, very, very dominant. Marriage Bill, the Sardha Act, eventually was passed. Reforms varied for upper caste. Now, there was the way in which reform was seen by an upper caste woman or a lower caste woman and a middle class woman. For example, for an upper caste woman, the matters of education that I, I should be educated or that or the matters of widow remarriage were more important. And for that, if that the widow remarriage act was um, uh, allowed, uh, was passed or if she was educated, that was reform for her. That was emancipating for her, emancipation for her. For lower caste, just the fact that she was allowed to cover her breasts, huh, was able to go to the temple, was emancipating for, for her. That was reform for her. That was empowering for her. So you see, everything, uh, there's no one fit box for every, everybody. Everybody, every woman, every uh, woman of different castes or class has certain needs or certain expectations from the society and that gets fulfilled. That is empowering for the 20th century institutional mechanisms. Uh, there were certain institutions that were uh, formed, uh, WIA, the National uh, Con Con Commission of Women, in Women, Indian Women, uh, NCWI, AIWC. These were all um, organizations and institutions that were formed in the 20th century. And by and large, they, were mid they had middle class orientation. Apart from this, M.N. Roy was uh, instrumental in uh, fighting and talking about rights of women workers. Okay. There were other women luminaries like M. Reddy, Shafi Tayabji, Sarojini Naidu, Amrit Kaur. Kaur. Again, they were from well-heeled families, but they laid different programs for women rights. 1920s and 30s were also um, uh, women, uh, other issues that were uh, the women's issues uh, with the national movement increasing uh, and gaining ground. Gandhiji's mass movement uh, uh, also saw greater representation of women in number in public spaces. For example, women were uh, they they were they were encouraged to picket foreign clothes cloth shop. We, we know about the boycott movement that uh, boycott movement that Gandhiji had initiated in his non cooperation and civil disobedience movement. Um, uh, picketing the cloth shops, liquor shops, mill uh, mill gates. So uh, these were activities that were led by women of, of households, of women of middle class, lower classes women. There were also some firebrand radical women like Latika Go, Sarojini Naidu, who became dominant in the 20th century and were like really um, uh, leading as examples for other women. They did not lead to fundamental transformation of women's roles within society. So whatever I've spoken about in terms of various women taking lead or various women uh, reform movements, at the fundamental level, there wasn't much transformation within the women's role in the society or for shaping her, their identity. So in fact, the, the reform of family laws was never accepted that within the family, the position of a woman or how a woman, uh, sh what a woman should be expected. Now, these were things that affected women directly and indirectly, more directly, but they were not being debated or talked about. So questions of reform of family laws, for example, found no support. They found no support from, they found support from nobody and no organization or political party at this point of time. So these were things that um, were happening around the women uh, issues. Modern factory changed the way we started looking at women. They changed the nature of work relations. Women were going out to factories. So now that they were stepping out, traditionally uh, things were changing. Tradi the way the, the traditionally the, the, the way things were happening until now traditionally now that was being changed. That were changing. The issues of safety, sexual harassment, low wages because um, uh, low wages. Why? Because women's Salary or a wage is always treated as a secondary wage because she's treated as a secondary wage or not. Till today, in fact, I think the male house of female household, uh, um, ma the male of the household is tre treated as the breadwinner or the primary wage earner. Now, these are so constructs that have been that have we've seen it in history, we've seen it in past, and they're still there. It's very difficult to break these um, 
these notions about women. So uh, at this point of time, the 20th century, they were treated as second wage earners. And which I said that even today, women are fighting for as uh, being equivalent to the way men are, um, uh, wages are. There's still problem with the way the wage debate is still on. Uh, writings of Radha Kumar, Janaki Nair, and Sasmita Sen have, um, have really uh, opened the way we look at women across India. Like now Janaki Nair have, has uh, written about uh, uh, Mysore women, you know. So Sasmita Sen has written about women in Bengal. So, so let's let's try and read this from our resource. The Factory Act of 1922 um, that excluded women and children from all heavy work, prohibition of night work for women workers. So these were things that were also happening around the women issues. Women peasant groups. Now they were visible. They became more visible during the national movement, especially in the protest movements by Swami Sahajanan. And uh, later, uh, we see Cap Captain Lakshmi in the INA, Godavari Palu pa Parulekar in working class, working with the Varli tribe. So there were many people doing, and many women working around the women issues. So all of them had carved out their niches. Niches means that they were they had their own space where they were trying to fight for women's rights. It did not really nothing became as big as and revolutionary at this point of time, which impacted and transformed the way women were being looked at at this point of time. Let's quickly move to the third unit, which is on social discrimination. Um, now, my first point um, on social discrimination, now, all of this that we've done, the gender issues previously, the colonial forest policies and all, all is related to the way the, at social level, at at samajik star pe kaise discrimination ho raha hai? Just the fact that you are branded as a criminal tribe, for example, it's a social discrimination. So let's see that how, what are uh, other features of the social discrimination during the colonial period. The interface between colonial state and society and a relationship among Indians. So this social discrimination, samajik star pe jo discrimination ho rahi hai, wo impact kar rahi hai aur wo um, uh, present hai colonial state, society aur relationship jo Indians ke saath inka hai. Indians ka ek dusre ke saath hai, colonial state ke saath hai, apne samaj ke saath hai. All of this is interconnected when you talk about social discrimination. Even the way Indian um, Indians are looking at other Indians, that's also changing. Okay, so let's see social discrimination and backwardness present in India before the colonial rule. British ruled British rule remolded many of these pre-existing social hierarchies and created a structural basis for institutionalized discrimination. Now the key word here is structural basis for institutionalized discrimination. Now, discrimination and social difference and discrimination is not something that is, that is new in any society. Before uh, uh, colonial rule came, uh, uh, was established by Britishers, uh, social discrimination was there. Caste system is the biggest social discrimination India suffering till now. But the, when the Britishers came, they remolded it and they created an institutionalized discrimination. That, for example, when they when they branded criminal tribe and they made criminal act, tribal act, they institutionalized that discrimination. Institutionalized means that there'll be legal actions on this particular thing. The notion with which the uh, Britishers came to India and all of us are familiar with this is the civilizing mission. The Britishers as a white man's board and Professor Mishra has also just spoken about that, that Britishers thought that it's a white man. It is my burden. It is my duty to uh, civilize people of Asia. It is my civilizing mission. So the racial superiority that I am the male, I have the masculine virtue of a master race. That's what Britishers felt. And they devalued, considered the, uh, uh, the Indians or the colonial subjects as devalued feminized form. Right? So this is how they, so there was the, there was at the initial stage, at the outset, the foundation of their rule was only discrimination, was based on social discrimination, where they thought of themselves of an upper, um, uh, having an upper status and the people that they're ruling as lower bodies, as lower colonial subjects. So if you really see, and it has been showcased in a lot of movies also that are based on the British um, 
um, colonial period, um, uh, the the Bollywood movies. If you see, you know, Lagan, for example, you know, you'll see that Britishers always maintained their segre segregated position in India. They always had separate houses, separate which were away from the main city or the main or uh, the rural setup. They would have their own uh, clubs. They would have their own uh, restaurants. They will have their own court. So they, when they came to India, they uh, they maintained the segregated positions in in the, when they were living in India. They shared relationships with India to an extent that for the purpose of governance. Unko Indians ka zarurat thi. They needed Indians because they had to govern India. They had to rule India. To that extent, they kept relationships with the Indians. In fact, many Indians, all Indians, had to, were expected a certain restrictive behavior in front of the British colonial officials. They were not so. All of this is pretty much depicted in in many uh, movies also. And if you look at them closely, you will know that when you look watch these movies more closely, you will see that you there's already social discrimination between the colonial power britishers and the way they're looking at indians all classes of indians there's already discrimination racial biasness you know in every activity and uh, um, in every uh, actions that they are doing opposed ilbert bill uh, ilbert bill was uh, a bill that um, that allowed the indians to try the europeans or the britishers they opposed that they did not want the, any Indian to try them. Try them means in the, in the court of law. Indians denied opportunity to join civil services and the Post Office Act 1854 charged double poster raise from indigenous newspapers. So you can already see that there is discrimination. Why were they not allowed to join the civil services that was to function as administrative body for India? An Indian could not be a part of the civil services in India. Only people who are passed out from Oxford and Harvard, Indians who are passed out from Oxford and Harvard, were allowed to be a part of Indian civil services. The Post Office Act, 1854, it, uh, it actually asked, uh, uh, charged double postal rates for, from the local newspapers. And newspapers that were coming from Britain were charged less postal rates. The most important and the, uh, the stark uh, way in which Indians were discriminated socially was when uh, the imperial darbar was held in 1911 and the king george v was was crowned as the king of india it what does what does this demonstrate this demonstrate racial distinctiveness this demonstrates political social discrimination bernard escorn is a very very famous anthropologist he talks about the colonial rule was a cultural construct it, there was a process of acquiring information and this process of acquiring information was to strengthen and legitimating of colonial rule in India. So Cohen is saying that why is Britishers collecting so much information from people or about the people? If you look at the way the many gazetteers being written at this point of time, many books, many histories being Britishers, British officials are writing. Why are they doing this? Because they want to know these people, Indians to rule them better. It's a process of legitimating that we know you more than you know and that we know you because we know your history and we know your history so we are telling you that if you do this, then you will be more better for you. So they were trying to legitimate their colonial rule that when we will rule you, we will tell you what, we are, what you need to do and what you need, need not do. Okay. So it's very interesting the way they were playing with the cultural dynamics of their own functioning. Now, also, there were continuity and change in discriminatory practices based on caste. So caste system was always there in India, and we know um, its dynamics by now. So that also changed over a period of time. And Britishers used the caste system to discriminate even more. They said, yes, you are already custom. We are doing something new. So that made them um, uh, say that we are legitimately uh, making a difference between, for example, Beals and Kohli's. So they were already basing their justification on certain discriminatory practices that were there from pre-colonial period. So, for example, Beals Kohli's were made dependent laborers. On the other hand, the landowning, trading caste Hindus, who were generally um, of a higher caste traditionally, were treated as high, pure, and superior. 
by the british so they were also playing around the way the caste discrimination was there in india before that they remolded it they worked it around their own needs so there was also a discussion on hallis the bonded labor now i would like you to look at it from the year so there's a lot of discussion on that clothes and the customs were also markers of social discrimination there were also religious and social discrimination that you can again take a look at it from um the source uh, ev source another important theme of this unit is popular protests and social structures now again all of this all of this conflicts and disturbances that have been had that has that has come about with british rule in india has led to protests it's not that people are not protesting indians are not protesting protesting what is happening around that so let's see terms like fituri hul din ulgulan vidroh these are terms that are used for popular protests now imperialist historiography denied exploitation of india um uh, takes credit for bringing intellectual awakening in india nationalist historiography has long fo- has for long focused on national movement now why have i why have i put this particular point is that for the longest time there was no discussion on what are popular people what are normal people how are normal people reacting to the british rule was there only gandhian national movement happening or was it was there only moderates and extremists or at the popular level at the more um, general level at the ground level were there any protests that were happening there was no discussion on this for the longest time in history writing so this has come about later and we see that uh, common people like you and i were also at that point of time people like you and i were protesting how are they protesting so these are words like fituri hul ding uh, you know these are local terms of protest that were happening and popular among the, uh, uh, by the popular people of different regions in india some important works that have been done on popular protest um, are by sb choudhry study on role of peasantry in popular movements kesh suresh singh's work on protest on by birsa munda must have heard the munda rebellion in in ranchi um, the ranajit guha's work on popular aspects of peasant insurgency Gyanendra Pandey's and Kapil Kumar's analysis of Kisan Sabha in Northern India in 1920s, Mridhra Mukherjee's work on Punjab. So these are some of the uh, dominant, um, uh, you know, in fact, pioneering works on popular protests. Who have act- protests were already happening; they were not being written by historians because the focus for the longest time, when uh, uh, when this uh, modern period of India is being discussed, is the national movement. because there's so much study happened on national movement there was it, it was not very exciting for people to do popular protests as in a, for for studying on popular protests but they have been pioneering works of the, like i've mentioned who have studied popular protest and brought that aspect of the modern period the colonial period to us um, through their works again because uh, uh, we know that there were pro- popular protests but now by now i've already mentioned indian villagers were no more treated as little republics ki apne mein mast hai wo apne mein they are doing things and they are happy with their the little republics the little uh, regions kingdoms the little republics i think uh, charles metcalf has said this uh, many a times in his writings that uh, indian republics they they are indian villages are indian republics they in fact were not separated isolated indian uh, little republics they were they had socio economic ties within the village between the village and with the urban centers prevalence of caste system did, did not denote a rigid division there was always upward nobility social mobility that was there so social differentiation was buttressed by customary and cultural norms faith in superstitious and ritual sanction you know village deities so social differentiation among the people or uh, within a village or a urban setup is also determined by the way um, superstitions and rituals work uh, by limited role of education people are ignorant by village deities religious religious beliefs that sits, that shape their belief systems uh all of this was already there social differentiation but there were many ruptures that were created by the colonial rule and that's the second point of the slide it was introduced because of introduction of land revenue system advent of christian missionaries the encouragement that britishers gave to land lordism commercialization of agriculture deindustrialization you know so all of this resulted in severe ruptures severe uh, dent on the society All right characteristic of popular protest generally uh, you can see from the uh, specific protests you can study from your e resources were they were more localized restorative 
against indebtedness, violent, gradually they became more organized. There were also at times role of women. And later, these protests were merged with the national movement. So these were general features of popular protest during the colonial period. Some of the protests that you can refer to from your radio source, the great details given, I'm not, I'm not going to go into details, is on the coal revolt in Bihar, Santal revolt, Munda uprising, Mopla uprising, Punjab Kisan Sabha, and the protests in Telangana. So please take a look at you know, these um, revolts from the EV source. Now, the last segment of uh, this particular unit is studying tribes under colonialism. Uh, we Now we have a, a bit fair understanding of what these tribes and how they are being impacted uh, by the tribe, uh, by the colonial rule. I think my first unit discussed that in detail, even the, when I, I, we were talking about gender briefly, the social discrimination aspect that uh, I, I spoke to you about, that also discussed that how tribes were looked at or perceived. But there have been constant study on how tribes what these tribes were and um, uh, the way these tribes were being manipulated, articulated and what the way they were identified uh, in India by the colonial power. Mm -hmm. So tribes were identified as outside realm of sedentary civilization. So the basic nature of tribe when you when a word tribes come to you, you know, you think Wo hamare space mein nahi hai. they're outside our realm. Hum sedentary hai, hum ek jagah sthit hai. Or tribes, wo ek jage pe hai, wo hamare se alag hai, aur wahi pe hi unka rehna, pae, peena, khana, uh, paani. Or unka apna ek space hai, wahi pe they are moving, they are practicing cultivation, whatever. Or they are doing other, uh, other activities like pastoralism. So they are generally identified as outside realm of sedentary cultivation. From the, uh, as outside realm of sedentary cultivation. The descriptions that are generally found uh, about tribes, terms like lords of rugged hills, ravages of lawless tribes you know so british saw themselves as people who have the duty the civilizing mission to teach tribes a civilized behavior an orderly life and that's the reason that's where the role of the christian missionaries you know came in the britishers in, 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 encouraged the christian missionaries or in India, especially in the tribal regions, because they thought that the main um, uh, uh, moral duty of their rule is to civilize these uncivilized people. These uncivilized people is not, I am saying this, from, uh, this is the British way of thinking. They wanted to civilize behaviors of tribals because they thought the way they have been living so far is, is ravaging, it's, 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 it's barbaric, it's, it's, it's uncivilized. So for them, the way they looked at tribes was something that they need to school and they need to, in, uh, they need to school, uh, civilize them. With the advent of colonialism, what affected them the most was that they, they were told and forced to settle on a certain territory. Settlement of territories and land rights. When land started to be fenced, then started to be controlled, started to be, um, uh, uh, the, the land rights, when the land rights were made, land no more could be used by everyone openly. That's when, you know, this happened more when uh, colonial rule came to you know, being. And that affected the tribals the most. 19th century witnessed the worst of living conditions of tribal people. And you will see that the entire 19th century witnessed huge number of uh, tribal uprisings across India. Because tribals were being affected for because of forest laws were being made, land was being, um, land settlements were being made, uh, the permanent land revenue, land revenue system, the Mahalwari, Rayatwari, all of this affected. It enclosed land uh, to a certain uh, purpose. Not everybody could move or use land that openly. So because of this indebtedness grew, extreme dissatisfaction that had led to many protests in the 19th century by tribes. Many had fled from their land. So because of this, many we see that even the British or some British officials were forced, the, the forest department was forced to create an area where otherwise band shifting cultivation could be practiced. Because in the 19th century, there were so many protests by the tribes that they, uh, the Britishers were forced, the British Forest Department was forced to actually 
uh, demarcate certain regions in different parts of India where tribes could function and do their thing, do sh practice shifting cultivation or you know could practice their own uh, ways of subsistence. So in this way, some welfare measures were put in place. Some. And all of this also resulted in creation of a certain tribal cultural identity. So can you imagine the kind of pressure that these tribes had built in the 19th century for British? Even when Britishers tried to force certain legalities, actions, brutalities, you know, harshness, aggressiveness on these tribes to be a certain way, the tribes revolted. And that forced at times the Britishers to um, uh, to 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 agree to a certain region where these tribes could um, and bargain certain powers that uh, the tribes could bargain certain powers for themselves. So there are interesting debates among the anthropologists, the colonial officials, nationalists, and the way they looked at tribes, their perceptions of tribes. So please look at this particular section in detail from your e-resource. This was a long uh, lecture, and I'm, I'm sure I've taken a lot of time. But this has been a, a, a block for five units. And I've tried to look at the first unit in detail and the rest of the four unit in you know, marginal detail. So please look at your e-resource. And if there's any question I can take now, I will be happy. And if there is uh, no question, the questions come to you later after reading the e-resource, you could write me an email. My email has, has mentioned. So I'll, I'll close at this. And uh, I'll uh, request um, Professor Mishra to uh, take up, uh, you know. Yes. OK, thank you very much, Dr. Kriti Deo, for your brilliant exposition of the society under the colonial period. You have almost touched everything, tribals, then protest movements, then gender empowerment. And within a short span of one hour and so, you have, I mean, touched everything. And we wish that in future we take up other topics because learners will be benefited much by your lecture. And there were some questions which had, I mean, which have been answered by Dr. Sakir Hussain in the chat box. And if any more questions are there, please ask her. Otherwise, we'll wind up the session. Please, any questions or we'll wind up the session. I don't think any questions are there. So thank you very much, Dr. Tripti Deo. Thank you, Mr. Ekedas, Dr. Prasakir Hussain, and all others present who enjoyed her talk, her lecture. And again, we'll be meeting her on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And she'll be giving talks on other aspects of Indian history, as well as a talk on Thursday on origin of Islam from Saudi Arabia. So once again, I thank you all of you for this pleasant session. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And I'll see you soon for the other lectures. If there's any question, you can write me an email. Thank you. Namaskar. OK, bye. So that's our session. One question, do okay, Mr. Das. Okay, sir. Oh, okay, sir. Okay, stop recording.